Ruth and I have spent most of lockdown here living on the boat. It's been a great place uh, to do lockdown. Lots of people walking past, plenty of company and also that important aspect of being separated from others for a time. I wonder how lockdown has been for you. It's a challenging time for many people. Many people, the isolation that they have felt and the separation that they have felt have been extremely difficult for them. It's interesting that within the Bible there are many different stories of lockdown and people coming out of lockdown. Think about things like Noah and the ark, a period of lockdown and coming out of lockdown. Joseph in prison being brought out of lockdown to serve in Pharaoh's courts. Moses being brought out of lockdown to rescue his people from Egypt. Egypt the people of Israel being released from Egypt, coming out of lockdown into the wilderness. And then wilderness as a period of lockdown from which they move into the promised land. And then later in their history, the exile where they are locked down in Babylon, only to be released back to Jerusalem slowly, drip by drip, stage by stage. We can even see lockdown in Jesus' life. Lockdown in the wilderness, released through baptism into service. Lockdown in the grave, released through resurrection, to release the spirit who has been locked down to move throughout the world. And the apostles, Paul and Peter, imprisoned at times and then released from that lockdown to serve the church. The release and easing of lockdown is a time of great opportunity. It's a time for great creativity, an opportunity for the church to lay down much of its heritage from the past in order to pick up new opportunities and new ways of being and really to reach out into the 21st century in fresh ways. It's a time for us to behave differently. Who did you invite to the garden? on those first few days as lockdown eased? What was the first family and the second family and the third family that came round? Were you able to use them for witness and evangelism? Were you able to use them to build up the church, to encourage one another, to pray with one another? How have you used the next step of easing where you could have two families round? Have you been introducing Christian neighbours to non-Christian neighbours? Are you using it as a time of witness? If not, why not? And how corporately as a church are you using the easing of lockdown? Are you prepared to open up for private worship? Are you thinking about how you as a church can reorganise round small household clusters and gardens to meet, to worship together, to grow together, to evangelise together, to plant many churches together throughout the community? Joshua, who we're looking at this morning, was one of the early spies who saw more possibility than he did problems. Yet his possibilities were drowned out by people focused on fear, frustration and lack of faith. So when we get to Joshua 1, we're at a place for Joshua of a second chance. A chance to ease out of lockdown, to dream dreams and fulfil visions. And God has given him a clear message for this time. Be strong and courageous. Four times in one chapter the same message. Joshua, be strong, be courageous. The background to this story in Joshua is very straightforward. The Hebrew people have been enslaved. Moses comes, leads them out of Egypt. There is the exodus. The law of God has been given to them. They now have a structure for being a people, a people of promise, a people on the edge of promise. 
the 12 spies go into the beautiful land but they come back 10 of them with bad report two with good the people listen to the discouragement rather than the dreaming the people listen to the bad news rather than the good news they wander in the wilderness for 40 years of lockdown till all of that generation has passed away then God provides a new generation Moses dies and the new generation led by Joshua experience this new opportunity something similar is happening in our land at this time there is a new opportunity for the church and we're going to explore that in a little bit more detail this morning but let me move inside away from the surrounding now noise so we can concentrate on these words of scripture well Joshua's uh, message to the people of Israel is very clear it's time to get ready precisely he gives them three days to get ready to move into the land no spies no endless strategy meetings two million people on the move in three days at the end of the weekend clearly Joshua was not a Baptist moving that fast Brenda Francis once wrote, some people are very decisive about avoiding decisions. It's sometimes so much easier to put off making a decision. But easing out of lockdown for the church is not a time for dilly-dallying. It's not a time for hesitation. If we hesitate, many opportunities will be lost. They are coming and going at speed. People are looking right now for a place to pray. People are looking for others to help guide them in those prayers. They're looking for a space to grieve. They're looking for anyone who can help them and we must be ready to move. When that family was first allowed to visit your garden, we were prepared to welcome them. We got things organised, but are we ready to move as a church in these times? Are we ready to be available for the unbelieving neighbour? Are we ready to have a conversation, run an alpha course in our gardens? Are we ready to take church well away from the buildings that we know and love for years and do church elsewhere for a long time before we're able to gather as we once were? in church buildings are you ready to start moving at the prompting of the Spirit of God are you ready to support those who've been shielding they're only just being allowed to take the first tentative steps how as a church are you responding to their needs right now have you created spare spaces where they can welcome other people who have been shielding? Where there's no chance of them catching a virus? Where there's no chance of them coming in contact with somebody who's come in contact with someone who's come in contact with coronavirus? Have you been creating a space where people can pray close to them, if not next to them? Have you created a space where they can just experience the warmth of the presence of God as a couple of believers meet together in the presence of the Spirit. It's so vital that we're ready to respond courageously to the needs of the people in our community right now. Three days to get ready, Joshua said. But are you ready? Even if you've missed all the opportunities of the easing of lockdown so far will you be ready for the next opportunities will you be ready next Thursday for the opportunities the First Minister gives for the church to go and grow in this strangest of times you know as a church we should never be waiting for the command to go that command has already been given if you like that command to go is the standing order of the church. We should always be going. We should be always ready to go. In fact, 
it should be a case of waiting for the command to say whoa, waiting for the command to pause, to hesitate, to rest. That's the unusual command for the church. The command that we have been given that is our standing order is like the one that Joshua gives this tribe of Israel. It is the command to go. Going is our natural tendency as believers in Jesus Christ. The second thing I want to point out is, as a, are we going to rely on the word of God as we go? Or do we think we know better? Joshua only has the words of the Old Testament law. He only has the words of the Torah. His job was to interpret the will of God based on that law. Be strong and courageous, it says in verse 7. Be careful to obey all the law. Joshua had to have courage to obey the law. Notice in verse 8, he's to keep it on his lips. He's to meditate on it. He's to, quite literally, murmur it over and over again. You may be familiar with Jewish people who wander around speaking the words of the Old Testament law to themselves. This is what he's been told to do, to recite the law so that he knows the law, so that the law directs his path. The word is meant to take hold of him and become the breath of life to him. And when that happens, you instinctively do the right things. You instinctively do what God commands you. You instinctively forgive. You instinctively pray. You instinctively prefer the needs of others. You instinctively give because the word is so in you. I've been struggling with the passage in Philippians 2 for several months now, where Paul says to the Philippians, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who did not grasp equality with God, but gave it up, became a servant, humbled himself. It's tough to be like that in this world. That's the opposite behaviour of most of this world. To instinctively empty yourself. Instinctively sacrifice. Instinctively welcome. Instinctively empty yourself of white privilege. If that applies to you. At a time when God is speaking to us about racism on a global stage. It is to... Learn to live in the way that Jesus did. We don't read this word of scripture over and over and over again so that we somehow know it in our heads better. The whole point of examining scripture is so that it changes us. So that it corrects us and rebukes us and wait for this. So that it encourages us, so that it gives us courage to live out our faith the way that Jesus would. It's not easy to live in this way. It's not easy to go in the Jesus way when the world around us is so different. But it is vital that we as a church show ourselves transformed by the living word of God, as Joshua was called to. And finally, I want to ask the question, how will you grow in courage? And to answer that, I want to make three brief points, but I'll go inside before I do that. Three brief points on how we might grow in courage. The first one is use courage. Courage is given to those who use courage. Even the Wizard of Oz knew that. 
You cannot store up courage in a jar in the hope that one day, on the right day, when you really need courage, you can open the jar and take it out and use it. Courage grows through use. It's a bit like the sourdough we've been using in, in lockdown. The more you use sourdough, the more the sourdough grows and your starter develops and develops and develops. That's what it's like with courage. You need to keep the jar open. You need to keep drawing on it. Whether that's in combating racism in the workplace, whether it's when you share your faith in the garden with your neighbours, or when you offer to pray healing over them when they are sick. It grows when you have Christian friends around and you encourage them to pray with you and for you and to partner with them in reaching your neighbourhood. Courage grows when you take risks of faith, when you behave as a church in a way that you've never behaved before. Courage grows when you do that. The second thing is actually about discouragement. Because there are many people around who will discourage you. They will suck the encouragement out of you. It'll not work, they'll say. Really? You think so? I write. There were ten discouraging spies that Joshua and Caleb had to come up against. Sadly, they died rather quickly after their discouraging report. For the next 40 years, everybody who listened to their discouraging report had to die. Everybody suffered because of those who sucked the courage out of the room with their words of discouragement. What did Jesus say to those who tried to discourage him from taking the path to Jerusalem, to the cross? He said, get thee behind me. Satan. If Jesus had listened to their discouragement, the outcome would have been that the whole world would have died in their sin. For some leaders, the task of encouraging is in suppressing the voices of those who would try to discourage. Sadly, churches have their fair share of those who will discourage things. They sow doubt. They sow division. They are not the gift of God that they think they are. Their discouragement will lead the church on a path of destruction. Lockdown has been a period for self-evaluation. Should have given the opportunity for looking into ourselves. And that opportunity still exists. If when you look at yourself, you recognise that you have been a person in the church who has slowed things down, who has discouraged innovation and creativity, who has preferred things the way that they like them rather than allowing the church to move forward, then why not take the opportunity to invite a couple of the church leaders round to confess that before them, to repent of that discouragement and ask them to hold you accountable to becoming an encourager. It may take a few steps. The first step might be just to remain silent for a while before moving on to finding a voice that encourages the creativity that is God-given and blessed. And may the Lord be with you if that is you as you seek to change your character from one nature to the other. But I plead with you, don't be stubborn. Don't get in the way. The third and final point I want to make is be an encourager. 
Encouragement is really just a, a pat on the back. Good job, preacher. That will keep a preacher going, but it will never start a new one on the journey. Encouragement is more than a pat on the back. Encouragement is to give someone else courage. How do we do that? Maybe we do that through our own lifestyle. If I live in a way that is generous and you see that, maybe that gives you courage as a brother or sister in Christ to live generously. If you live with a forgiving heart and I see that, maybe I will live more easily with a forgiving heart also. If I see you living faithfully, it is easier for me to be encouraged to live faithfully. In this passage that we are looking at in Joshua 1, two and a half tribes of Israel are encouragers. They give courage to the other tribes by going first. Bizarrely enough, they have nothing to gain out of this. They already have land on one side of the Jordan. They don't need to cross the river. They don't need to scale the walls of Jericho. They don't need to fight the other enemies that lie beyond Jericho but they willingly do so. And in doing so, they give courage to those who'd rather hide at the back. They say to them, we are going in front, now come and follow us. Will you be that type of encourager? Will you be the one who has the courage to start church in their garden next week? And as more and more people are allowed to meet together outside, It'll be in your garden that they're meeting outside these people who have never believed before your neighbours gathering to find out about Jesus from you. Because if you do that, you will give courage to someone else in the church to do the very same thing. If you're the one who has the courage to confess your sin as a discourager to the elders and the story is told that people are doing that, others will have the courage to confess their sin and the church will grow in courage. We encourage people by leading the way with courage. Don't store it in a jar. It won't be there when you open it. Leave the jar open and keep drawing courage day by day after day. I truly believe we stand at the edge of a great opportunity for the church in this nation. An opportunity to transform who we are and how we relate to the wider world. Get ready now. Be ready for next Thursday. Be ready for when Nicola Sturgeon tells us what the new easing will allow for God's witness, for community, for sharing, for blessing others. Start living that true word, courageously living like Jesus. Serve without hope of personal gain. Stop thinking about what you want. Start thinking about what this world needs you to be. What it needs you to surrender for it to grow in Christ's likeness. Stop discouraging. Start encouraging. And do not let fear of the unknown stop you. There will be rivers to cross. There will be cities to conquer. There will be armies to overcome. But with courage from God who loves us, this is more than possible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us that you wrap your everlasting arms around us and you hold us secure. Lord, from that place of security, of knowing we are your chosen people, of knowing that your kingdom is coming, set us free to courageously live lives significantly different from the world around us. Let our attitude be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Show us how we might live. Show us how we might conquer this land for you. Show us 
how we might give of ourselves that others might live. Lord, we long to see your kingdom come. Set our hearts free from all that we have known of tradition, of all that we have known of the way of doing church in the past, so that we might be ready to grasp this fresh opportunity that is before us now. In Jesus' name, Amen.